Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Talukat series by Sofan and the Safe Space. Uh, as you have seen in the last five or six episodes that you know we are talking about relationships in this particular th- series. Safe Space is basically a platform where a couple of therapists, mental health professionals come in together to provide you different services uh, when it comes to mental health, something that is relatively less talked in Pakistan. But uh, personally, I believe it's something that you know we are getting there. We are getting to address these issues uh, way better than before. Talking about Sukhan, uh, Sukhan is a digital platform and where we are talking about different social issues and taboos through the art of conversation and visual storytelling. So today's topic is something that is very relevant in these times. Uh, we are talking, we are going to talk about relationships in pandemic, how it has affected our mental health, how you know that behaviors have changed, how we are struggling at times when it comes to work, when it comes to our relationships, when it comes to our interactions. And, you know, when I talk about us, we are, I'm talking about all the professional, I'm talking about children who are going to school, I'm talking about undergrads. So this is uh, what our episodes is going to look like today. And I, I'll try my best not to make it sound like another thousand per previous podcasts that have been recorded in the last one year. Uh, so for that purpose, we have Noor Durani with us. Uh, so, say pehle to welcome to the podcast, Noor. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. You. Uh, so, Noor is basically a foreign qualified physiotherapy. She holds a master's degree in mental health counseling from Columbia University in New York. And she has a bachelor's degree in psychology from Canada. And she has been working in public and private sector in Pakistan, Canada, and USA. And she has experience working with a variety of issues, including anxiety, depression, relationships, trauma, abuse, and terminal illness. And relationships is something that... I am interested in today. So before we get into all the technical stuff and we try to figure this topic out, Lou, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Just hanging in there. I think uh they say So even though things are pretty bleak right now. But getting right, uh jumping directly into the conversation, uh I know we have a lot of people have talked about it. We, there are thousands of videos available. But in your view, how pandemic has affected uh, our everyday relationships and interactions with our family, with our friends, our professional network. So uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think it has affected to a great extent, right? Because um, we are used to social interaction. We're used to meeting people. Yeah. Um, we were used to, uh, I should say, it's been over a year and a half of the pandemic, which has really affected um, how we feel about our relationships. So there's, there's had to be a lot of renegotiating relationships, mm-hmm. uh, whether it be friendships or familiar relationships or anything like that. There's been a lot of um, even work relationships, of course, when they have moved to a virtual space as opposed to you know in person. Um, that's been a big uh, change. So in terms of, um, you know, if you start with families, uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, forced interaction uh, somewhat uh, where there's an on, almost like an overt forced connection um, that is uh, that was present because, uh, you know, when you're at home, when you're working from home and you do not have that space where you're OK, you have a routine, you go out, then you come back home and then you spend time with your family or you're around them. When you're constantly around them, the expectations are, of course, different. And um, so there have there would be times where you're you don't you want your own space or you do not um feel like maybe uh, you know being around your family that much or spending that much time with them but you don't you feel like you don't have much of a choice and it's that the one thing that i think a lot of people feel uh, you know in this pandemic and that has brought, been brought up is again a lack of control and we like as individuals thrive on control and when we feel like that's been taken away from us in terms of both our you know relationships but also in terms of knowing when where where are we going with this like is this a short-term thing is this some, when is the end you know there was there have been so many false ends um so the way we you know approach those relationships or the dynamics or how to uh, go about it have also been different because when it's a short-term thing you're of course like you know you have a different mindset um when you're going into it but when you know it just doesn't seem to be ending when it's uncertain when it's just the unpredictability of it that of course creates a lot of feelings of anxiety and uh, just like not having control over what to do next, what's the next step. And that can, you know, 
to be a good i have a question here uh, we are talking about obviously you talk about stress that is coming with pandemic and you know uh, but in your experience you have been talking to people you are talking to uh, your clients as well so are people able to realize that you know at this point we are now stressed and you know it has affected us so much that you know my interaction with my child my interaction with my partner my interaction with my parents is being affected and you know i need to do something is it something that they are able to pick themselves uh, or it's something that you know uh, an external person would have to tell them yeah i think it's definitely something that they are able to um, recognize in themselves and acknowledge it but i think where the confusion lies is so what do we do about it so I, i understand that it's there i understand that maybe i know boundary has been like a buzzword lately and it some people are sick of using it but it is a, a, a case where certain boundaries had to be set with people and but there was a confusion about how do we go about setting that boundary like how do we go about setting that boundary with our family uh, you know or how do we go about setting that boundary with a partner when we're forced to be in the same space um so much of the time uh you know how do we navigate that um so you know there's the willingness to engage and that um you know breeds authentic connection and then there's this other kind which can of course result in resentment and then it's like okay i'm feeling it but i feel like i don't know what to do about it what can i how how am i supposed to have that conversation with a parent you know who how do how do i not hurt them in the process how do i explain where where what i where i'm coming from right. so um they're able to pick it up but i think uh where the you know more difficult aspect is okay what do i do about it now and then i think that uh, is that you know we are talking about even a normal functional healthy relationships uh, a fu- functioning family uh, is feeling the heat of it you know they are uh, they were stuck in their homes for a long time they couldn't travel uh, and we'll be talking about that in detail later but in case of uh, a dysfunctional family structure uh, in case of an abusive environment where a lot of times getting out of that house to study to go to a job uh to go to meet a friend is there uh is the way they keep their they, they keep themselves sane for instance it's their getaway and now yep. uh those people are stuck in their homes and with the people uh, they have a toxic relationships and they can't really leave uh yep. so that is i think a bigger challenge and uh, what's your take on that how uh, big of challenge is that first and how do those people you know can navigate through that Yeah. I mean I think uh I completely agree with you. It's an escape, right? Your work is an escape. Your um student life when you're going to university that's an escape from a household that doesn't feel safe at times. Um it doesn't um you know it makes you feel trapped. Um especially when if you're a non-conforming individual uh, or if your values do not align with the values of your family. Um it is something that you know makes it a lot more difficult uh to be around uh you know that And I think some of the ways that uh, I I can talk about this is in terms of especially the marginalized communities um the LGBTQ community I work with a lot of um uh, members of the community so I have you know personally from my clients um seen um the hardships that they have to face when they during this pandemic especially in Pakistan when the norm of course is living with a family um so when that is the case um it is it has been incredibly difficult it has been um very difficult when you're when you don't get those pockets of you know safety when you do not have that community if you if your friends are the people that you are out with you know you so you uh, or those are the people that respect you those are the people that understand your sexuality your orientation all of those things and your family in in the household you you basically wear a mask and uh there's only like so long that you can wear that mask for and when you're for extended periods of time having to be around that um and being you know for like the trans community or non binary individuals if you're being dead named constantly if you're being misgendered and you can't even correct them because you're there's the fear of being ostracized of being cut off um and or worse so uh it's this constant it this it creates this dissonance in you it creates this you know thing of like well the sense of self is really questioned it's like it's this aspect of okay um i do not align with these values i don't uh think this way 
Um, but I'm having to hear homophobic remarks. I'm having to hear transphobic remarks. I'm ha- having to hear things about me that only if my parents knew that they were talking about me. Yeah. You know, it's it's a really painful experience. It leads to it leads to a lot of anxiety. It leads to a lot of you know depression and worse a lot of you know. I've I've noticed in especially with the LGBTQ community a lot of um, in Pakistan specifically um, suicidal ideation uh, because of that feeling of you're trapped. You, there's no escape, and you can't be yourself. So what would you say would be some of the techniques or some of the things that these people can do who feel trapped in these situations and, you know, they want to do something to keep sane, uh, keep themselves sane. They want to fight their way through this. So what are some of the, I don't know, techniques, suggestion, advice, whatever uh, you want to call it for these people? Um, I think some of the things that have helped them is, of course, uh, the virtual aspect has really helped them because finding finding online support groups, right. um, uh, which you know where you can be yourself and uh, where you can talk about these things, where you can also just you know talk about the fact that we're all going through this together and how difficult it is with like-minded people, with people who you know you can relate to. Um, so finding uh, those groups has been really helpful. I feel like also uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, of course, you know, the way to deal with it is the people that you cannot see. Well, let's FaceTime more. Let's, um, you know, talk on, like video chat more. Let's um, try to just feel like an escape. Yeah. So one way of like finding uh, the escape would be um, gaming online with your friends or, um, you know, game, like being on your phone and playing games, uh, but which are interactive in some way where you're still, you know, talking to another friend. Um, so, again, like see- seeking that out more. Um, is helpful uh, where you feel like okay I can be almost in my bubble of you know in my safe bubble because like these are the people that understand me I can't see them there's restrictions around it it's not safe it's all of this stuff but I can I still just reminding yourself that you have that group still there's still people who do understand and of course like therapy can also be a really helpful uh, place there where you can talk about how difficult it is to experience that day in day out so uh you just mentioned, you know, the virtual aspect of this pandemic where we are uh, not most of us, all of us are connected with each other uh, through this virtual connection uh, where, you know, we are making video calls, we are talking over Zoom, we were attending Zoom calls and meetings. So we were studying that way, we were working that way, you know, we were in touch with our loved one in that way. So, but then, uh, so what's your opinion on our virtual interactions and uh, virtual interactions when you compare it to uh, the existing physical uh, connection we had? So let me re-emphasize in the way that, you know, we used to meet people. And now yeah. I'm talking to the same person, uh, probably about the same things, but just on a video call. So yeah. uh, what do you think? What's the difference in between? Is there a difference to start with or it's just like the same thing? And if there is a difference, and obviously when you spread it out over a time period of one and a half year, then uh, a lot of different challenges arise with these virtual relationships. So what would be your comment on these things? Um, So I think that's a very layered question. So I will answer it in uh, different parts. Um, So I think like, you know, of course, there there is definitely a, you know, a difference between having physically being present in a room with someone. Um, and in certain situations, even if you're not interacting, but just their right. presence, you know, can be comforting, can be soothing. So in the absence of that, uh, when you cannot, uh, you know, when you are away from your loved ones, uh, when you cannot be in the same room as them for their safety, for your safety, um, when you cannot touch them, when you cannot be around them, it's, of course, very different, like, you know, FaceTime and everything. As much as technology has helped us, you know, feel closer, um, it's still, it's not the same we know there's a difference. We, we feel it. Um, and we feel it in the, in terms of like the energy in the room too, when we're in the room with a person, you know, it just sometimes, like I said before, the presence itself is enough. Sometimes you don't have to even have a conversation on FaceTime. It's like, but I feel like some people have used that virtual space in that way too, where they're like, would just have their phone out or, or, you know, or their laptop or whatever, and be doing their things just to feel that presence, you know, because, uh, you can't have it, you know, in another way so that's one way that people sometimes go about it so um if i talk about my work and if i uh, specifically uh, talk about therapy in this um uh, so 
even though there may there is of course a difference between online therapy and in person therapy um i feel like some of the weight that is put on um uh maybe how much more advantageous in person therapy might be um from a client's perspective uh is more so to do with the fact that it's not accessible mm-hmm. so it's the fact that when something is not available it's more valuable to you so you know like around it's like around the idea of the scarcity principle basically mm-hmm. that this idea that um again i'm not i'm not not minimizing how good in person therapy is of course but i feel like you know the weight that's put on it or the idea that that a client might have that i would be um because it also feels like it's something that's being withheld right it's it's something that i could have i could have seen this person online I, if yeah. it wasn't for the pandemic i would be in person if it this pandemic is taking this away from me uh so it's something that you know i deserve or something that i should be getting um i it's being withheld and that idea um you know then makes us question certain things where it makes us feel like oh we would be so much so like further along in our goals in therapy or uh we would be our relationship with our therapist would be so much better if it was in person mm-hmm. and uh again not to minimize that yeah there may it that might be true but it's not that big of a difference because there's also some other advantages to uh you know online therapy and the virtual things that we sometimes tend to ignore for example like Uh, a lot of clients who may have chronic illness chronic fatigue just um difficulty moving if or just difficulty um you know finding convenience or getting out of the house to uh, seek out therapy it's a uh, this uh, the way that you know therapy moved um online um so yeah it just helped them uh, gain access to something that before they couldn't they didn't have access to so i feel like that's a really that's something that's an advantage that sometimes overlooked and another thing is that um for some clients actually depend and it de- this depends on the diagnosis it depends on the personality type and everything um there's been reported cases of actually feeling like you're you're developing a more intimate relationship with your uh, therapist because of the virtual uh side of it or the virtual um yeah the fact that it's you know online yeah. you're maybe it's it's maybe sometimes easier to say certain things uh when the person is not in front of you maybe it's easier to open up um so there is that side of it that i don't i think should be acknowledged yeah i think you're spot on because a lot of people especially young girls in pakistan who were not able to go to therapy previously because again you know getting out uh, from your home at 6 pm uh, getting a public transport and you know then coming back and answering questions of your parents or whatever your guardian or uh, loved one says that you know and especially when you're hiding that you're going to a therapy so in that case now since taking your classes your calls is kind of a normal thing in your home now because you are studying on your mobile you are taking uh, zoom calls zoom classes so a lot of uh, i know a couple of people who are now taking therapy under that pretext you know i have a call at 6 pm but technically they are taking a therapy session which yes uh, as you rightly mentioned made me happy because you know they were able to access that and that barrier uh, of you know getting being physically present which was uh, something of a hindrance previously now was gone but now again you know so with the virtual you mentioned that accessibility was there uh, and you know people were able to sit in their homes and talk to therapists about their problem but at the on the other side i think the major problem was uh, that when if you are working professional and you are technically working from home then your day never ends if you are right. a teacher and you are teaching uh primary or secondary school your day never ends because technically uh you are at home and it's been considered that you know you are basically partying it's a vacation so you are forced to work until 10 pm at midnight you are getting messages from your boss and the boundary that you know when you leave out of step out of your office there is some kind of obligation that you know that my work life is over and I'm going to go and enjoy with my kids and my family but right now you're basically moving from sofa to sofa yeah. and that is something you know even i uh, i often say that you know even we don't even register that you know we are off from work because we yeah. literally move from one sofa to another sofa in our own uh, in the similar same room so uh, what uh, is your comment on those challenges where the work life boundary has you know turned into a gray area 
and the employers are at times exploiting their situation that you know that you are not working at home you're not even coming to office so you should be working all day long uh the workload yeah. is more than before so and not to forget that we are in still in the middle of pandemic where we uh, get unfortunate news of losing a loved one losing someone in extended family losing someone in your friends family to this deadly disease uh, i mean for the last month in this september only in september pakistan's death is 73 deaths per day so there are 73 grieving families every day at least and then you know when you multiply their relatives their friends a lot of people are still suffering and uh, we are still you know in middle of pandemic so coming back to the original point uh, the work life balance that has been affected uh, what's your take on that yeah i mean i can definitely you know relate to that on a, a personal level of course that to moving from sofa to sofa and the, like your day never ending um i think like it was really important for me what helped me with that was trying to actually be like okay my workspace will be different i'm not working in the same room that i am like living the rest of my life in um and um you know but again even with that i had to acknowledge the privilege that i have of a space that is big enough where i can have one room which is like my workspace and everything and then i can you know once my work day ends i can shut that door enter another room and kind of in my mind to you know have different spaces um but again that's a privilege and that's a very this is social economic privilege that like people not everyone has when you're living in very small spaces you you do not have that 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 separation that you can make you know you cannot have that divide so you're right there's the the work uh, and uh, personal life there's the merge it's a gray area it's just blurring of the boundaries um and as you rightly said employees i have you know it's really disheartening to see but they have exploited that a lot there is no you know official clock out time so uh, you're just expected to be available all the time your availability is taken for granted even though just because like it's like almost like oh we're doing you a favor by letting you work from home so then like the price that you have to pay for that is that you're working till 12 am or that you know there a meeting is being set up for at like 11 pm or like you know like like you said your boss is messaging you the boundaries that are again being crossed and you know not everyone is in a position to push back also um and not all employees are you know going to be very uh, responsive to your feedback around it they may not be interested um so and also you know it's ignoring all of these other things that like working on like you know of course zoom fatigue is also a thing and all the meetings being on zoom and all of this and just being on a staring at a computer screen for hours on end um you know and uh, doing that there is a stamina that you have to build for that too a different kind of stamina to work you know long hours on a computer um and doing online meetings and everything students have also felt that uh in terms of uh, taking their classes but um you know again we need we need to move around so also physically it has like limited us because when we're just sitting in one space and doing this we're not it has uh, um you know our body needs to move if if you're young, young and healthy and you know energetic and even if you're you know even if you're older you still want to move so it's also limiting that which is uh, also creates some mental health concerns so definitely a physical disturbance of you know to your life um also a lack of stimulation like you know not just physically but sometimes it's not the same uh, kind of interactions or the same kind of work that you're doing if you're just on your computer you're not having these um you know different dialogue sometimes with um different team members or it can sometimes be a you know, nuisance at work you but it's something that you find yourself missing um you know when you're when you don't have that because you're like well that actually was helpful um maybe it was annoying and disruptive to my work at sometimes but it was something that really you know gave me energy gave me that push um so yeah and you're right workload has increased um people are not uh, respecting you know that aspect to it uh and a lot of people are feeling you know a lot really burnt out and uh you know that also is you know different kinds of burnouts are being experienced um so as a you know as a therapist um there's a, you know another phase for it is like compassion fatigue um so that you know because our work is constantly uh you know uh, tending to and being you know uh, empathic and uh really trying to put yourself in other people's shoes and when during a pandemic 
the the issues are um, so complex and so you know difficult, and you care about your clients and you listen to them and you are, you know you you have weekly sessions. You know what's going on in their life. It's bound to affect you. Um, it's bound to have an effect on how you are you know living your life. And then there's counter transference that's happening. So it's also un, an, an unprecedented uh, unprecedented area that you're in, right? Like you're going through the same thing together. N- neither of you have experienced a pandemic before. So you don't have the answers. They don't have the answers. You're both kind of, you know, in this new territory and you're just trying to be like, how do I, how do I work through this? Um, and your know, client might want answers that you don't have because you're going through the same thing. Uh, you wish you had them. You wish you could help them more. Um, so there's that, you know, added pressure on yourself that, you know, I'm supposed to, you know, have a better understanding of it, or at least um, be able to give some sort of feedback that can be helpful. But at sometimes you're at a loss too, because you're so drained and you're so burnt out. Um, because again, like, you know, in the, when you think it's short term, you're dealing with it differently, you know, when, and again, when it just becomes like, it's just not ending, when is this going to end? When is like, you know, like going to go back to normal? Although I do not think there's going to be, like, there's going to be a new normal. It's not, I don't believe that life will go back to how it was before. Uh, but having said that, um, there's still this, uh, you know, the lack of self-care um, that uh, especially mental health professionals, we tend to not care for ourselves at times um, when we feel like, our clients need us a lot and we, you know, tend to like overwork ourselves um, to and not take breaks because we're like, well, how can we leave a client um, during a time when they're, you know, in distress? How can we take a break? We feel guilty about that break even. So that just adds to the burnout. But then, you know, you have to really think through the fact that like, unless you're in a good headspace, that's, you know, you're limited in the capacity of how much you can help the other. So what have to some take of the, Sorry, cut off to what are some of the steps that, you know, the therapist and mental health professionals are taking uh, to prevent and, you know, to look for their own self-care and, you know, to tackle all these challenges? I think one of the things is like, ther- therapy is a very isolating profession. Like, you know, it's a, a especially if you're in private practice, um, if you do not work, uh, you know, if you're not working in a co-working kind of uh, space uh, where, you know, in between sessions, maybe you can see people and all that. Uh, so, and then you add the aspect, the online aspect to it. So it's even more isolating that. Um, so I think one thing that we, uh, you know, realized and we reached out, you know, colleagues, we reached out to each other and we were like, okay, I think we need to, especially when things started to seem like, you know, they're uh, getting a little better. Well, one thing was, okay, let's let's talk about how difficult it is for us. You know, let's actually talk about that. Like how, you know, specific to our profession, how difficult this has been, uh, mm-hmm. you know, how, how the pandemic has affected us, how it's affected um, the work we're doing or how are we questioning our work? So, you know, one, one way is of course, like peer supervision. Um, another way is like, we usually have supervisors otherwise too. Um, so I, I remember going, like talking about this, you know, a lot of times with my supervisor discussing the fact that like, yeah, like I'm, I'm feeling it like, and like, I mean, you might, might have read this article, like, or heard this term languishing that the, uh, about that New York times, um, article, uh, talked about and everything. And it's what everyone is feeling. And I, it's like what my clients would come to me and they were like, yeah, that is the word we needed a word for that. You know, we needed a word for what this pandemic is doing to us or how it's making us feel. And, um, so yeah, it was the way to deal with it, of course, is really try to, you know, take a step back and just kind of remind yourself that you are a human too and not just a therapist. Because uh, we sometimes think that like our clients forget that, but we also tend to forget it at times that, you know, like we still need to take care of ourselves. And um, so whether that is just like taking time, you know, to ourselves, like for me, um, Again, a virtual thing that has been really helpful is that um, a lot of uh, meditative, uh, like meditation uh, groups online um, are more readily available now. Um, and I feel like that uh, was a thing with me that like I, it was on my schedule, it, uh, you know, once a week, that was something that I was doing. Um, that, uh, so meditation generally, I felt like really helped me, um, you know, take care of myself in that way. Then just like, again, doing something which is not therapy related, 
you know so i'm not something that is not reading a book about like brushing up on my knowledge or something something that is literally to turn my mind off um sports was my go to which again when sports was halted i was like i like that was that used to be my escape which was something that i was like okay i don't have that anymore that doesn't feel good um but then again it was interesting when it started back up and even though it was like empty stadiums uh and like i saw it like uh, i saw like uh, you know the silver lining there too that i saw was um there was no com- like because of there was no crowd noise when you would w- be watching matches you could hear what the coach just were saying to the uh, players and i was like great i'm getting this insight that i never would have otherwise so you know just trying to find the silver linings of like during a pandemic that's like the most the, the thing that you can do is just like it can't be all bad you know what is it teaching me what helpful information is it giving me even if it, it's with a client like and i'm not feeling the energy or i'm i can't um, the, the body language is missing you know maybe i'm getting stuck in the narrative a lot or the content of what they're saying and not really uh, you know being able to uh, gauge glean other things that might be happening like i can't see their hands sometimes so i can't see if a topic you know has made them fidget or if some they're shaking their leg or it's made them anxious those things that you know you can see in person so yeah in the absence of not being able to um, see that body language uh but if you have the conversations with clients about the fact that how how are they feeling about this distance this removal the screen this barrier uh to connection um and what that might represent for them that it's not just about this how are they experiencing that in other areas of their life and how to grapple with that um and that can be really useful information that you know we can get and then work with so I- one thing that you know i would like your comment on is that uh, you mentioned uh, a lot of people had different hobbies someone uh, a lot of people used to go to gym workout was their you know uh, escape if you can say yeah. or it's something that they really enjoy people love going to or like they love going for swimming for a run uh, yeah. hanging out having a coffee with your friend uh, going to stadiums like you mentioned but suddenly we need to find new hobbies uh, yeah. and you know our go to places which were you know our happy places our good places where after of a training day or an argument you just go there you do that activity uh, but that has also been limited or restricted due to pandemic especially the outdoor activity yeah. i'm talking about so uh, what can people do uh, to navigate through that system because you know not only you are facing more challenges in your daily life your escape or your good places are also gone so you need to find uh, a new hobby first of all my question would be is it possible to come up and start loving a new hobby uh, or uh, it's not possible or it's just uh, it's more like a medicine that you have to take the new hobby it would be more like a medicine secondly you know generally what are some of the things that people can do to navigate through these things Yeah, so I think definitely uh, taking up a new hobby is it, at any point in life. I feel like it's uh, something that it, we're uh, as long as we keep an open mind to it, um, we are we can definitely find things that we enjoy that we never thought we could, um, or that we just never bothered to because we had enough things that you know kept us occupied that you know kept us entertained that we didn't have to seek these other things. Um, so I feel like uh, you know during this pandemic, one thing that I have seen is that. uh people have you know sought out these activities so some of them being virtual um like you know there's netflix parties so watching movies with your friends so trying to you know find some semblance of normalcy in that way um but another thing is like um you know I, at least i've noticed that there's been like a lot of people who really got into gardening and uh during this time um so that is something that you know it's again it engages you in different ways because like you know it's a new thing that you have a lot to learn there but it's also something you can do with your hands it's something you know um that you can see uh, you can take care of it's something that you know you can develop a relationship with it's something that uh you know that so that's that's one hobby that i feel like uh people have uh, been drawn to and uh that they've enjoyed a lot um then also just finding again communities and groups that um in socially responsible ways are still doing things outdoors in karachi i noticed that uh there were uh, you know a lot of uh, cycling groups there were running groups um uh, people were um you know walking out their dogs more um and just to feel like that sense of community just you know just to be on the street with someone keeping their distance but still um you know 
doing that uh i felt like that was in lahore too i saw i think this is this time i it's the most that i've seen uh, especially women you know cycling and like feeling comfortable doing that and feeling safe doing that too of course like it comes with um you know the other side of it uh which is you know unpleasant sometimes but it was definitely something that i felt like you know because they were this the outdoor aspect that was missing um they people did try to find ways to still engage in those activities um with people in a uh, responsible way um so that was another thing uh and then again of course just uh, sports like even older people who had maybe like you know uh, given up certain things they start, started in, uh, being in, engaging themselves again in sports and um things like that um then there's like arts and crafts that a lot of people picked up because again it was like a time to like seek out things i know a lot of people were really into cooking for like quite a while where like i couldn't see an instagram story that did not have like some baking or some like you know banana bread thing happening <laughs> um so uh you know they there's always stuff that you can find and yeah. uh board games like ludo made a comeback as well people were playing yeah. ludo all the time we used yeah. to play uh, ludo right after dinner every day because it became like a family activity so this pandemic has robbed us all uh, of a lot of these moments uh, i would like your comments specifically on education sector for example you know uh, the kids who got admission in the school but they have been studying uh, virtually so far they have not actually went uh, they actually haven't gone to a class uh, met their teacher sat with other kids shared lunch and you know and uh, we used to joke uh, among ourselves you know that you know your actual challenge will start next year when you will actually go to drop your kid because right now your kid is at your home sitting in your lap and taking a class and he doesn't really understand that what's happening or what school is for that matter similarly then we can also talk about other group that is uh, undergrad who are in their last year of college or who are in sec or in the first year they never started really started the university they are studying virtually so all those experiences they have been robbed and they uh i i would like to think that they actually understand those experience so far because they have not gone through those things you know uh, breaks of those folks at that ke samosa khana in university break with bachcho ke sath khelna ek dusre ka lunch khelna and all that activities so these are the things that you know that on the they are way beyond they go way beyond your normal degree your degree is not just a piece of paper your education yeah. experience is not just a piece of paper so uh ऐसे जो एक्सपीरियंसेस हैं जिनसे देयर इज एन एक्सपीरियंस देयर इज अ फीलिंग कि यू नो वी हैव बीन रॉब्ड व्हाट्स योर टेक ऑन दैट एंड आई थिंक डेफिनेटली लाइक इफ वी टॉक अबाउट किड्स यू नो यंगर किड्स यू कंप्लीटली राइट दे डोंट इवन नो व्हाट द कांसेप्ट ऑफ स्कूल इज सो इन अ वे दे डोंट नो व्हाट दे हैव मिस्ड आउट सो दे आर लकी राइट नाउ बिकॉज़ दे डोंट नो व्हाट दे आर मिसिंग आउट ऑन यू नो दे डोंट नो हाउ गुड इट कैन बी और लाइक यू नो दैट इंटरेक्शन विद फ्रेंड्स लाइक प्लेइंग टुगेदर डूइंग ऑल ऑफ दैट uh but of course it's like you know we can see like you know that it's such a it's a loss that they missed out that on that one year that they could have had um but i think that i would want to mention like the invisible labor of parents in that situation the um, the homeschooling that they're having to do on top of their yeah, you know, yeah, full time yeah. jobs and everything um you know i feel like that's that's so much work that takes so much out of you and that they've been doing that for you know a long time for kids who haven't like yet started school but also um uh, for kids who've been in school and now like you know because of schools being shut down and everything yeah yeah you're having to homeschool the kids um so that you know it's a lot of you know pressure and you know added uh, stress on the parent as well which then it's interesting how that might come out uh, you know in different ways you know in maybe unhealthy ways um it you know can affect the child uh because you know the the adult has a lot on their plate and uh, their this sometimes the work isn't shared um and uh so that is something that sometimes is not seen that how much like you know mothers fathers ha- are having to you know um do that and teach their kids 
but um coming back to yeah the uh, this idea of you know being robbed of the whole experience and just you know that being limited to um you know for for other people uh, for other students just being limited to school uh, where it's like okay it's a classroom like you turn on your zoom or whatever um and you know there's a professor they're teaching you and everything again for both the professor and the student that's like a you know it takes away uh, from from them so for the professor of course you know and i've heard multiple accounts where it feels like we're talking to a wall you know we 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 like interacting with our students we like asking them questions and or like answering them but it this you know uh the, again the um this medium gives the opportunity for students to turn off their um video even yes. so they're you know they're kind of checked out there it's there's a lack of motivation you know rightly so it's not to be blamed again we're in the middle of a pandemic people keep forgetting that we're expected to do the normal things exactly. but we're in the middle of a pandemic it's like the the world outside is a normal but we're expected to go move, go on with life like you know things are normal so um definitely like you know professors ha- are lacking uh, some uh, you know motivation or just uh, not lacking but basically they it's hard to find that when they feel like you know we're talking to a wall we're talking to uh, uh, students aren't uh, responding students really are like they just you know just to mark present they're you know on the thing but they're not actually um, engaging um students on the other hand are feeling like you know again disconnected they're feeling like we uh, we also want to interact but you know where it's hard to feel motivated to listen you know like the setting being different we're not around our you know um, other students we're not in a classroom sometimes structure is important in that sometimes it actually does help so the too much of flexibility in that case where you can literally be in bed and take a class can sometimes not be helpful you know it's not you're not in that mindset um of you know the, so it uh, depends on the subject matter too but you can you, the concentration lapse of course happens and um that is something that you know in terms of the studies how that has uh, been impacted in terms of the education sector um now when it comes to uh, generally the uh, you know undergrads uh, and i really um think you're spot on in terms of the, you know them being robbed of that time um and i think especially um people who were you know graduating so students who were graduating or students who had gone abroad to study and uh, were either in lockdown so they did not get to have that full experience of you know uh, taking in the culture the city all of those things that it entails but also um, this aspect of uh, you know student life is something that we especially when it when we're coming towards the end of it so like the you know undergrad like end of undergrad is when we find it even more precious and when we really want to prolong it as much as possible because even if we're working uh it is still student life feels like a safety net it's still something like we're not adults yet we're still like you know we have we're, we're a bit protected we feel good about that so we want to prolong that and then if that last year is just taken away from us if we've been looking forward to that year you know uh and being like okay we're going to make the most of it we're going to do all of these things that maybe we didn't do in the first 3 years and all of that and then it's like well you have no option to do any of those things uh it's really it's really disheartening and it's really it does feel like yeah that like i did not get that chance to um be a student for one, one more year i've been now thrust into the adult life uh without being able to close that chapter in a way that i wanted to or to say goodbye to that maybe stage of my life even if it's temporarily Right. um so that of course is like unsettling and just feels like you know creates anxiety just creates just um distress because you you feel like that was something that you wanted to experience and it was taken from you last year is basically something that uh, last semester particularly something that you're celebrating different days uh mm-hmm. you hang out uh, the maximum because you know you might not ever get the chance to be together in single single class uh lot of there are a lot of pranks and actually teacher are also quite lenient during the last semester <laughs> as well so yeah you yeah, have i graduated graduated almost 11 years ago and all these memories are coming back of my last semester right now uh how fun it was coming to uh, you know uh, we have talked about the professional challenge we have talked about uh people who are suffering at their home stuck at their home but one thing you know is uh, i would like to comment on is that you know okay so there are two aspects to this question one aspect is that you are stuck in a country uh, away from your family 
uh, because you were studying there, you were working there, and you can't travel. You were not able to travel back uh, to your family for one year, two years. Maybe you still haven't been able to, and you don't know when you'll be able to go back home and meet those people. And of course, you are in touch with, touch with them over video calls and everything. But then again, we have talked about the presence, uh, the power of energy uh, of being in the same room. So loneliness takes over uh, isolation. When you are in isolation, uh, the anxiety, depression, stress takes over. Uh, for particularly all those people who want to be there, who have a healthy relationship, who want to be with their family. Uh, so everything seems fine. You are on talking terms. You are getting support. But yet again, you are away from your family. And yeah. at one point, you know, you can talk on your video call throughout the day. But at night, just before you go to sleep, you will feel alone. You will feel stressed out. Or you, you know, go through that phase uh, where you struggle. So uh, loneliness, isolation in this pandemic is, uh, I would say, much worse than in normal circumstances. So how can they... Uh, keep their sanity and sustain themselves through these tough times. Yeah, um, I would want to uh, just comment on the um, isolation and loneliness aspect first, if that's okay. Sure, sure. Um, so, you know, I do think that um, there, so the way I see them is like slightly different, um, isolation and loneliness. So like, you know, people um, are definitely feeling higher rates of isolation, uh, which is like the physical detachment. So like what you said, that, you know, you're not the lack of physical presence. Right. So they're feeling that a lot, which, you know, which is, you know, that's the isolation aspect of it. And then the loneliness aspect is like the subjective feelings of detachment, which have been increased um, during this, uh, you know, during the pandemic, because, you know, hypothetically someone can like um, be in a crowded space, but still feel lonely. Yeah. But it would be hard for them to feel isolated, um, you know, and they still can, of course, if they're, you know, in a crowded room or whatever, they can still feel isolated if they're being excluded or, um, you know, some somehow ostracized or things like that. But so there's like a slight difference in that. And I feel like loneliness can be like dealt with by having like meaningful interactions with others. So even if they're physically distant. Uh, you know, it can, uh, you know, yeah, you, so people are more inclined to have these interactions on video chat or like, like I said, you know, before, like watching movies together, playing games together. Um, isolation is more challenging to deal with because, you know, especially during a pandemic, because you have to be physically distant and that's the aspect or like, or you're stuck in places, you know, like you said, um, uh, you're stuck in a different country. Um, you're, you know, or you're, um, even if you're in the same city, um, you'd mentioned this like, you know, before uh, the podcast that you couldn't um, hug your grandmother, for example. Yeah. Uh, so all of these experiences that, um, you know, people are feeling and uh, so that the physical distance and uh, that, you know, what some, some people, how they navigated that was that developing like pods or bubbles, um, you know, in like their own COVID bubble. Uh, in terms of, you know, close circle of friends that they uh, spend time with while mitigating risk. So they would, um, you know, very close few people that they know that we're the only ones meeting each other and we're, you know, taking uh, precautions. And so I think that after four or five months in Pakistan, like the first, you know, four or five months, I think people started doing that a lot more where they started to uh, start f forming those pods because the isolation was really getting to them. Um, you know, and on the topic of like, you know, physical interaction and like the presence and, you know, there's the aspect of touch, which is there is, um, there's like terms, uh, which one term is the touch hunger and one term is like touch starvation. And these are real things that we experience. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when we're, uh, if, especially if someone is living alone. So someone is abroad, away from their family, cannot even meet friends there, you know, in isolation um, or quarantining or whatever the case may be. And, uh, you know, touch is limited or it's eliminated. They can really uh, develop like touch starvation and uh, how that, you know, impacts our health. So there's been research done, it impacts our health and it's been um, associated with like increases in stress, anxiety, depression, and uh, even like, you know, healthcare professionals, um, they need to, they, they're very aware that there's an important role that touch plays in like a patient's healing, even during pandemics. Mm -hmm. um, so there was like uh, this uh, Ebola outbreak 
And, um, you know, in that there was like no touch guidelines, uh, you know, that made it difficult to diagnose a patient uh, without touching them. Uh, but the isolation that the patients felt, you know, was also compounded because um, like the nurses or the staff could not, they, they were limited in their ability to convey connection or to, or to provide support to uh, patients with touch. So mm-hmm. well, that's the thing, like humans need touch. We are, you know, we are, are it's very something that we're so used to, we take for granted, which this pandemic really, you know, to, uh, brought to the forefront how much we took just handshakes or hugging or just like, you know, all of these things for granted. Um, because, and there's also definite like biological aspect of like the endorphin release that happens when you hug someone you care for, or you, when you, you know, touch them. And that was something that was completely um, lacking. Um, and then there's the isolation aspect of it, which again, um, you know, similar to like uh, the touch uh, thing, it does, uh, there has been research which has shown um, that, and, and this research has mostly been done on animals, uh, but it has been shown that there's a direct link in that the isolation, especially in adolescents, um, uh, and to abnormal development of like uh, the brain. Um, so, and that how that in adulthood then can uh, lead to, you know, some behaviors which can be really unhealthy, like um, excessive dependence on uh, to certain habits or addiction, obesity. These are things that have been found. And again, like, these are things that years like, from now on, we'll find more things about because longitudinal studies will be done and everything. But um, one way that people have navigated this um, is it's interesting. There's been a recent push on like animal sanctuaries, which have re- reported increase in adoptions. Um, so that's, a, you know, with pet ownership, I think that is something that has uh, been uh, really helpful for a lot of people because they found there's a lot of emotional benefits for people living alone um, or just, you know, uh, unable to uh, touch or be present with people where, you know, you have a, you can have a pet who would, and get some affection, love, companionship in a safe way. Um, so that is something that people have, you know, that's a way that people have found a way to navigate the feelings of isolation. You were talking earlier as well uh, about this point, and I think uh, I just reminded me of yeah, your last point, reminded me of that. You know, so as humans, we often look for external validation. Uh, we look for, you know, just not, uh, and in our previous episode, uh, on ourselves, you know, at time, I thought, you know, I was saying that it's at times very difficult to have a conversation and relationship with your own self. So at times we look for external validation and we need someone to, even if it's therapist, to come and tell us, you know, that it's going to be okay. You just need to do this. And mostly we already know what we need to do and, you know, what needs to be done, but it still feels, uh, it gives us more sport, motivation, and power maybe for that external validation? So my thoughts on that are that, um, you know, some of us, we do tend to uh, derive our se- uh, self-worth and value from the other. Um, and uh, the locus is external. So it is de- dependent on external validation. And uh, when that's the case, and, you know, we are we see ourselves through the lens of another. That's how we feel good about ourselves is because of how the other perceives us. Um, and, or how the other person is treating us. So then when we're in the middle of a pandemic and when we're isolated and when we remove the other, then what happens? Like what happens to the, our, the sense of self? You know, what are we left with? You know, it, it can feel like a huge loss and make you question, you know, that when I'm left to my own devices, like who am I? If I was always perceiving myself um, or, my, or my worth or my identity was so attached to how others see me, how others view me, um, or the you know validation that I'm getting that I'm good enough. Then when the other is removed, again, who am I? Um, so that of course is not a fun place to be in. It, like that's not a great uh, thought, but um, that is again something that you know leads to anxiety. But that, uh, and which people have struggled uh, in the pandemic with is sitting with themselves and sitting with that discomfort yeah. and cool. and introspecting and reflecting on like oh yeah actually. Like, who am I outside of this, uh, you know, external world that I've become so dependent on that I didn't realize till it was taken away. That's when, like, you know, it came to my attention that, wow, like, you know, this is, that's how much I needed it. You know, for extroverts, sometimes you feel that, like, um, for certain extroverts, they might feel that, you know, it's a desire that we want to be around people. But 
a pandemic or situations like this make you realize, well, no, it's turned into a need actually. And, uh, you know, again, what am I without the show that I may put on in front of people um, or that, you know, and how then that performance was reacted to and how that used to help me uh, gain a sense of self or, you know, how that, how I understood myself through that lens and now that's gone. So how do I understand myself better? How do I sit with the uncomfortable feelings that are coming up with that? Now, so we are almost two years into this pandemic and, you know, a lot has happened. You know, we have seen uh, the introduction of vaccination. We know what to do to minimize at least the risk of getting COVID or getting affected. We are not at the point where we can eradicate this disease, uh, but we know we are in a much better position to, uh, you know, tackle this disease. If, God forbid, someone gets affected, what to do? You know, uh, in the start, we were totally lost. But that comes with a different set of challenges as well. We're just talking about, you know, external validation. And if previously we talked about our social life and a lot of people, especially who were extroverts and in our South Asian culture, there's a tradition that you need to show up at every Desi wedding uh, of your proposed neighbors, brothers, daughter, and you just can't miss it. And same goes for funerals. So Kushi Gami ka je concept hai, ka you have to be there so that has been uh, a constant challenge in uh, at least in, and I'm sure it was the same challenge all over the world uh, in a different uh, different with different examples but a challenge to the role reversal where we were uh, we had to become parents to our parents we had to stop them forcefully at times or don't party this bad they didn't budget jane nahi de rahe so similarly, we have seen uh, something that was unexpected for a lot of people here that, you know, the rise of, uh, not the rise of, but anti-vaccination people coming into prominence, people not ready to wear masks. Uh, and in Pakistani context or South Asian context, it was, you know, relatively understandable because of our culture, our literacy rate. So you can imagine a lot of conspiracy theories going around WhatsApp. But then you see people protesting in Australia or, you know, in Europe that you don't want to wear masks. And suddenly you are like, what's happening in the world? These people are the leaders in medical science and, you know, they are the ones who are leading it. So your comment on these two things, how these have affected our relationship? Because uh, I believe that we have reached at a point where we are pe judging people's intellect, character, uh, empathy based on their beliefs regarding vaccination, masks, uh, taking a prevention, uh, preventive measure or not. So these dynamics, uh, the new dynamics of relationships uh, and the lens we are seeing them. Yeah, I think, yeah, you're, you know, you're, you're completely right. This has been a case with like with a lot of families that we've had to, the role reversal aspect of it, uh, where we've had to, um, you know, uh, literally be the ones convincing our parents not to go out, uh, telling them like, you know, like you can miss this wedding or you can like, you don't have to go to the mosque to pray right now. Like you can, you know, like it's, it's, we're at the height of the pandemic right now. Um, you know, you can like pray at home or like you don't have to do certain things um, because like, especially because, you know, at the end of the day, we're like, we're more scared for them than we are for ourselves because yeah. we're like, we're young. If we, you know, get it, if we get COVID, we are, you know, most of us do not have underlying um, conditions. So we're not susceptible to, um, you know, the how the road it can go in or the direction it can go in. Um, but so our parents are more susceptible to, you know, getting it, like to, they're more predisposed, but then also the effect that it can have um, on them once they, uh, you know, if they contract it. Um, especially now with the Delta variant, it's even scarier because it's like, you know, it, you don't know like how bad things can go. Um, so yeah, it's been a, a struggle. I think that a lot of us had to face, especially like, I think, um, uh, you know, South Asians uh, in, like more than maybe some other uh, communities where we're, you know, asking our parents, you know, telling them to wear masks or telling them to like, you know, socially distance and all of that. And they're not taking that seriously. And that, you know, making us uncomfortable, but also at the end of the day, really just scared for them. So there's, you know, constantly going between fear and anxiety, which is just like, you know, 
and we're staying at home and being super careful, even though we're not maybe feeling like we're not the most, you know, at risk population in that way. Um, and feeling, and then again, that leading to resentment sometimes that like, we're doing this for you, but you're not even, you're not help, meeting us halfway. You know, there's no middle ground that we're able to find because, you know, there's just a, such a, there's a generation gap and there's just a lack of understanding around it. Um, so there was definitely yeah, the role reversal, being your parents' caretakers, you know, seeing them as children, uh, being like being the protective ones of them. Uh, that has been like an interesting dynamic that has shifted. Um, again, renegotiating that relationship a little bit. Um, and yeah, also in terms of friends and in terms of um, this, the idea, the whole when when it was mass like like the pre-vaccination times when vaccinations weren't available um this idea of you know okay seeing your friends not being as responsible as uh, you wish they were maybe and um seeing a lot of people um you know and this was like also on social media just generally um in conversations people bringing this up that like this is kind of a deal breaker for me you know as a friend like i would because I'm not, it's it's not a personal choice, and to an extent, I agree with that. It's not a personal choice. When when it came to this pandemic, it was not like it's my personal choice to not to do this, to not do this. No, it's the it is a social responsibility. Like this is something like it, that's why there was like you know all this stuff said about don't do it for yourself, do it for others. So that's where like like you said, the empathy part comes in, where you know people started to question the the aspect like you know do you not have that. Um, empathy towards others do you not care for others how is how you know again the character aspect judging the character that how selfish can you be where you're only thinking of yourself and you're not thinking about others and you're not thinking about the fact that you might survive you might be okay but someone else you know you might cost them their life and how are you not taking into like why is your fun or why is your party like why are these things taking priority over someone else's health or you know possibly their life um, so that, and of course, um, you know, some anti-maskers being, um, equate, like seen as like, now they're the anti-vaxxers. And I do feel like there's a difference that sometimes gets lost, um, and also, uh, is not acknowledged, uh, which is sometimes unfortunate because, um, again, hesitancy, uh, you know, uh, around getting a vaccine is different uh, than not wearing a mask. Uh, because, uh, you know, again, this vaccine, there's, st it's still, we're, we, we will, it'll be years before we find out the long-term effects of it. And it was built at an incredibly high, uh, you know, uh, speed that none of the previous vaccines or of things no. have been, uh, created at. So there's hesitancy around that from some people, but, um, it's not sometimes allowed to be expressed. Um, it's attacked more which I feel like is creating more divides between people. It's creating more, you know, uh, because when you're not engaging in discourse, when you're not even trying to understand what the other, the hesitancies might be around, because in certain cases it's around fertility. Um, it's around, you know, things, it's around these long-term effects. It's not that they, you know, are just being careless. And I feel like if there was more empathy around that, that, okay, maybe, you know, just a little bit understanding of that, okay, that's their reason we might not agree with it. We don't have to agree with it, you know, but we maybe don't need to cut them off or attack them for this. Um, so that's the thing that's, again, like it's a gray area somewhat because, you know, and even I go back and forth between this, you know, I don't also don't have like a clear stance, like I'm fully vaccinated and I, you know, encourage, you know, people close to me or just generally people to to, to get vaccinated. But, but I, you know, still try to find, you know, like that empathy and understanding in the fact that, okay, yeah, you're, you're, you being curious around and you just questioning whether you, you know, before just jumping to it is not a bad thing, mm -hmm. but curiosity and questioning is not, should not be seen as something that is bad and that should be attacked. Um, so yeah, can I do, mean, uh, in pa unfortunately in Pakistani context, we can do another whole episode on what you just said on your last line that's another topic altogether that you know, it shouldn't be taken as a negative thing yeah but it's literally like our greetings have changed it's like you know instead of like it's like like hi how are you it's like oh you know i'm like can you have me like are you vaccinated yeah. am i vaccinated it's like you know so your it's a personal sense of value is even attached to True. not being a threat to yourself or not being threat to others so others because at, for for a while everyone was seen as a potential threat 
So now, like, not being inoculated is has certain things that people equate it with. But, but I think uh, this is the point uh, where it all comes together. You know, we uh, like it or not, we are all in this together. And through empathy, through discussions, through conversations, we'll be able to get through this and we'll be able to find that common ground where, you know, you are not hurting anyone, but then again, you are not taking away rights of anyone else either. So, uh, again, I, you know, I keep on saying, you know, we are still firefighting. We are not out of it. We are not, you know, out of pandemic. And then there'll be a lot of thousands of research paper or medical and sociological effects of this. But that would come in a later time. Right now, it's firefighting. Every day comes with a new challenge. You just master one thing and suddenly you had a Delta variant. And now, uh, you know, we are figuring out if that earlier vaccination was even effective uh, yeah. against the new one. And we don't know. We don't know. Yeah. Uh, I got COVID after I was vaccinated for, I, got, I was vaccinated for three, four months as a part of health worker workforce. I was one of the earlier people who got vaccinated, but uh, even then, uh, I got COVID. but vaccination health, that's a different decision altogether. But you know, it's still a gray area and a lot of people are, uh, even WHO is learning. The people who we look up to, uh, the instructions have changed over the time. So yeah. But any last comments, any last words, uh, if you were to summarize this or any... You uh, touched so many topics. I wouldn't yeah. know how to summarize. <laughs> okay. So as I say, if you want to give a name of the word, if you want to give a to the end, then Such a big question. Um, I think like I will echo your sentiments in terms of like, we're not out of it yet. Um, you know, let's try to be as responsible as possible, but let's also not... Let's try to not let this create more divides. True. Let's, you know, let's just try to engage in discourse as much as we, as possible and keep an open mind to things. Again, we don't have to disagree to, uh, sorry, we don't have to agree to, you know, um, yeah. So basically that would be a very vague, but general thing that I guess I can say. But no, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insights. It was lovely having you do on uh, today's show and we really hope कि हम आपको दोबारा भी तंग करें और second season में या future episodes में किसी और topic को लेके we will be discussing that but thank you for your time and your insights thank you yeah it was lovely talking to you and I do hope that we um, get to you know talk again and maybe there's uh, other topics that we can engage in definitely definitely uh, until next time uh, for the half is अगर आप ये episode देखना चाहते हैं you can visit our YouTube channel न्यू की डिटेल्स हर क्रेडेंशियल्स और किस तरह आप उनको कॉन्टेक्ट कर सकते हैं वो पोस्ट में अवेलेबल है आपके पास यू कैन रीच आउट टू हर इफ यू वांट एंड अंटिल नेक्स्ट टाइम फॉर ऑफिस थैंक यू